the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the community of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. We join together. Oh, that's my sermon that just hit the floor. I can't, <laughs> I have to make sure that that's in order. There we go. Now, let's join together in the call to worship. We gather to open ourselves to the Spirit of God. We gather, we gather to, to open, open ourselves to one another. In a spirit of compassion. In a spirit of unity. In a spirit of peace. We meet love face to face. And we sing together, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues, to sing this number, hymn number 374 in the Book of Praise. Welcome to worship as we continue to journey through this season of Easter. Today we are invited to think about our identity in Christ. What does it mean to be clothed in Christ? Whether you are here worshiping in person, listening in on radio, watching on live stream, or later on YouTube, we are so glad that you are part of this community. We acknowledge that Knox Waterloo is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee and neutral peoples. Our building is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land granted to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River. We seek a renewed relationship with our neighbors, one that is based on honor and deep respect. We give thanks for our ability to gather, worship, and meet on this land. Let us continue in prayer. All-encompassing God, your presence fills our lives. All that we are and all that we have comes from you. All that you do declares your love for us. Yet when troubles come, when adversity plagues us, we wonder where you are. We even wonder who you are. How quickly we forget that you are always with us. Dispel our gloom and despair. Change our garments of darkness into robes of dazzling light. Grant that we may clothe ourselves with Christ, putting on the attire of compassion, kindness, lowliness, meekness, and patience, endurance, and forgiveness. 
above all, both inwardly and outwardly, clothe us with Christ's love, which will bind us together in perfect harmony. And now let us join together in singing the prayer that Jesus taught us. the good news my friends no matter where you are God is there no matter what you have done God forgives no matter our reluctance to accept God God accepts us with assurance receive God's love and live in fullness and in hope thanks be to God May the peace of the risen Christ, who is alive and amongst us, be with you. We invite you to stay in place and greet one another with the peace of Christ. You can turn around you and wave or give the peace sign or whatever sign you would like. Peace of Christ. Hallelujah. Peace be with you. I love that little exchange. It's just, it's like a holy hello. Peace be with you and also with you. I love that. Uh, so I was, uh, yesterday was a long day for me and I had some really stressful moments yesterday and I had some very awesome moments yesterday. I started yesterday morning in North Carolina. I went down last week for a conference, which is why I was not present. Uh, I hadn't seen my PCUSA friends in a long time. And so I got down and attended this conference, was providing a little bit of musical and worship leadership. It was good. Anyway, long story short, when it came time to fly home yesterday, uh, I arrived at the airport and checked in and saw a big red sign beside my, f my flight number. It said, cancelled. And the first thing I thought was, oh, I got it. I, I, what's going to happen tomorrow at Knox was the first thought that I had. So I scrambled back out and spoke to the, one of the flight, um, the people who sit at the keyboard, you know, when you first check in. I don't know what they're called, but anyway. Um, her name was Sophie, and she was so, so helpful. Uh, and she said, okay, she said, it looks like there's no room on the next flight. So the only way we're going to get you to Toronto today is for you to get into a cab and to drive to the plate to the next airport, which was a couple of hours drive away, before it takes off to fly you to Toronto. She said, there were some people here just a few minutes ago. They were going to get a cab. Maybe we can catch them and you can split the fare. So we scrambled outside and sure enough, this, there were three people loading their luggage into the back of the cab. 
And Sophie said, can one more join you? And they thought for a minute, that that's going to be a pretty tight squeeze in the back of this car, but sure, let's do it. So what I found very interesting is there was a couple, one couple, but they wanted me to sit between them. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not going to... <laughs> anyway, not going to make any assumptions about what's going on there, but uh, I was stuck in the middle. Anyway, we had a cu couple of hours drive to the next airport. And long story short, I did make the, the, uh, the flight. But uh, short story long, we had a great two hours of getting to know one another. And the cab driver's name was Sasha. And he is the kind of guy that I would probably not connect with in the regular world. Um, he's, um, he comes from a military family, and there was military paraphernalia in the vehicle, and he was talking about things that were not of interest to me at all. But uh, anyway, but it was interesting. I enjoyed meeting him, but there was this initial resistance. I was finding myself kind of resisting. I was feeling awkward and not really... Yeah, resistance is the word that comes to my mind. I wasn't open to the new experience. And then he spoke about his wife. And he said that she, at 59 years of age, was suffering from early onset dementia. And all of a sudden, my heart just opened to him and to his story. And I said to him at one point in the trip, I, I will be, I'll carry your wife and you in my heart. That's my way of saying, I'll pray for you. And he opened up to me in a new way too. It was a really beautiful, I'm goosebumpy actually right now just thinking about it. It was a beautiful moment. So another part of this story is Canadian in the States with only $50 in American cash and credit cards that aren't accepted in every place. Most of the time my credit card works in the US, but sometimes it didn't. When it came time to pay the cab, it didn't work. So I ran, scrambled inside at the airport to try to get cash for this guy. My card would not work in the ATM. I had 50 bucks, I owed him 100 for the trip. And he said to me, Hugh, he said, it's okay. It's okay, it's, I'll, I'll absorb this. It was great meeting you. Thank you for the prayers for my wife. And we had ex already exchanged information. So I said, Sasha, you are so kind. And when I got home, I sent him the money anyway. But the point of, the, the point of my reflection, I think, is that there's a lot of kindness that still exists in the world. And I think that kindness can... We can op if we open ourselves, I move from a place of resistance and dislike to a place of compassion and to a place of openness. And that was a gift of the Spirit. I didn't, like, that was just a gift. But I could actually practice that more often so that in more situations I can actually experience and encounter that gift of connection with other people. Even people that I might not connect with on a normal basis or choose to be around. There's a lot of kindness that's still in the world. And I, I will remember Sasha and I will remember his wife. And he gave me a gift yesterday and I gave him a gift yesterday. And it was, it was really a, a beautiful moment. I hope we all can find more moments. In the spirit of Christian love, you know, when, when the disciples... Jesus gathered with the disciples before his death. He had one last chance to tell them the most important thing to remember. And do you remember what he said? He said, love one another as I have loved you. That's like the, the summary of his whole ministry. Love one another as I have loved you. And it takes work. But my gosh, beautiful things happen when, <laughs> when, when we do that. Oh. This is a song we've sung before. Um, the, 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 core, um, the words aren't up because sometimes we can just learn things by heart and uh, we don't need words. We don't need to be distracted by the screen all the time. The screen is wonderful, but we can just focus on learning, focus on the words and the music. Um, you may look high and low, but there's no place else to go 
we all need more kindness in this world. And I'm going to change the word each time. We all need more blank in this world. You listen for what word I say and join in the song as you can. This is a song by Guy Davis. Uh, he's a, a blues musician from the U.S. And uh, I just love this song. We all need more kindness in this world. Everybody. We all need more kindness in this world. You may look high and low. You may look high and low, but there's no place else to go. We all need more kindness in this world. We all need more laughing. We all need more laughing in this world. We all need more laughing in this world. Look high and low, but there's no place else to go. We all need more laughing in this world. It's a beautiful, sunshiny day. I think we need more sunshine. Literal sunshine and metaphorical sunshine, don't you think? Here we go. We all need more sunshine in this world. We all need more sunshine in this world. You may look high and low, but there's no place else to go. We all need more peace times, yeah, for sure. We all need more peace times in this world. We all need more peace times in this world. You may look high and low, but there's no place else you go. We all need more peace times in this world. We all need more friendship in this world. COVID has been hard on friendships, hasn't it? My friendships have suffered, and we have to work hard to um, reconnect with the people who have been important to us. We all need more friendship in this world. We all need more friendship in this world. You may look high and low, but there's no place else you go. We all need more friendship in this world. Last verse, we do kindness again. Here we go. We all need more kindness in this world. We all need more kindness in this world. You may look high and low, but there's no place else to go. We all need more kindness in this world. Amen. The scripture reading is from the book of Revelation. I usually preach on the Gospels because I love the Jesus stories, but every once in a while, it's fun to dive into a different part of scripture. So John wrote this particular story during a time of great persecution in the church. The Roman world was not looking very kindly on the Christian church. And Christians were gathered and executed. John himself was um, exiled to an island to live alone. And while he was there, he had this vision of, of a day of a better world, a day when the love of God would be known a lot more widely <laughs> than it was in his present environment. And this is part of John's vision from Revelation 7. Listen for what the Holy Spirit might be trying to teach the church. I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands, they cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne, and they worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, 
Who are these robed in white? And where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him all day and night within the temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more. They will thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will, will be their shepherd and will guide them to springs of the water of life and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the witness of the early church. Thanks be to God. Who are these robed in white? The writer of Revelation was asked. Part of a vision, multitude from every generation gathered together, praising God, all dressed in white robes. Isn't that an interesting detail? Their clothing is described. Clothes, clothes. In the beginning, we were born naked, naked and afraid. You know the story from Genesis, the second creation story after Adam and Eve ate the fruit. They became self-conscious in a new and profound way, and they felt shame. Perhaps their shame had deeper roots than just physical nakedness. Maybe the physical nakedness pointed to something deeper, spiritual exposure, emotional vulnerability. Whatever it was, it made them very uncomfortable. So Adam and Eve did their best to cover up those insecurities. They sewed a few fig leaves together. Some people read the story of Genesis as a story of judgment, God's punishment on disobedient people, but I don't do that. I read it as a story of grace. For in the end, God became their tailor and stitched for them clothes from animal skins did you notice that part of the story? God did not want her children to wallow in feelings of shame, so God came to them as seamstress and covered them. Because at that moment, that's what they needed the most. Clothes, clothes. A few chapters later into Genesis, there's the story of Joseph and his famous coat. Do you know that story? That coat almost brought poor Joseph to ruin. That coat, sign of his father's favor. That coat, sign of his brother's resentment. Clothes, clothes. Jesus criticized a rich man who was dressed in purple and in fine linen. Quite a contrast to the poor beggar Lazarus who lay outside the gate of the rich man. And Paul, well, Paul criticized people who came to church dressed in fine jewelry and beautiful clothing. There's a lot of clothing talk in the Bible. It's an image, a metaphor used over and over and over. And it's an image which covers, no pun intended, rich meaning for us in our relation to God Psalm 104 says, God is clothed in light. Aaron, the first of the priests, is said to be in sacred vestments to give him honor and holiness. It seems that clothes do make the man in that context. Isaiah, in chapter 61, talks about God clothing him with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland. Now, in this story, as it was earlier in Genesis, clothing is an example or a metaphor of, of God's grace. Isaiah and the psalmist and others throughout Scripture might have agreed that clothing made something of them that they would not have been 
without the special clothes. Put on a robe, and you're a priest or a minister. Put on another robe, and you're a judge. Clothes carry something of our identity. Clothing can let people know something of who we are, what we like, what we do. And in that respect, you could say that clothes actually have power. No wonder the gospel writers spoke of the clothing of Jesus as having power. If the woman merely touched the hem of his garment, she would be healed. Remember that story? Similar to the one later on in Acts that said that if those were sick, touched the hem of the garments of the, the apostles, then they too would be healed. Clothing has power. And in another wonderful Old Testament story, the prophet Elijah gave his mantle, kind of overcoat, to his junior, Elisha. And with that symbol, the, the power of Elijah was bestowed upon his, his, his student, Elisha. Clothes have power. On some old film footage of Nazi-run concentration camps in World War II, some scenes show piles of clothes which have been stripped from the prisoners. And then there are the clips of the bodies of people all naked. It makes me wonder, with all this talk of today's clo clothes, if a soldier dressed in a powerful uniform would find it easier to commit such heinous acts, maybe even justify such acts, against people who were naked, who had no clothing, who had their protection torn off them, their identity removed from them people who had no visible sign of power. And that reminds me of the Stanford prison experiments. In 1971, a professor at Stanford University did an experiment, and he took students. They all volunteered for this project. And they didn't know, the students didn't know when they signed up for this if they were going to be a police officer or if they were going to be a prisoner. And so one day the experiment started, the students all came, they were arrested, were arrested at their home and brought to the prison. And the psychologist watched how people interacted. And the experiment was to have lasted two weeks. And I think it lasted just a few days, like four days, because it became so violent and so abusive. Now the only reason is, no the clothing was not the only reason, but I think that's a part of it, that a, a person who has authority, who can hide the face with sunglasses and carry a, a baton and a uniform can change someone. In the same way, not having that, but just having rags as clothes can make someone feel powerless. Fascinating experiment. Read up on it if you haven't. I think you're getting the idea here that clothing is not merely just a covering. It's not just a utilitarian thing. Clothing has to do with our reality. Put clothes on a person and that person can change. I'll never forget the time years ago when I was asked to appear as Santa Claus at the office party of my brother-in-law. I know what you're thinking, I used a lot of pillows. <laughs> it was a crazy kind of party, everyone was having a really good time, they were imbibing. And the gifts that Santa had to give out were, were, were well, shall we say, a little on the risque side. Well, I was really nervous ahead of time, and, because I'm more than a little self-conscious in such wild and crazy contexts. But when I entered that room as Santa and no one in the room recognized me, I assumed a completely different personality. 
Now, it helped that I was dressed up so well that even my own sister did not recognize that it was me. I didn't feel like Hugh. I became this wild and crazy Santa. There was such a powerful transformation in me that it kind of frightened me. Clothing can make a person change. When I wear my gown, I feel a certain way. When I was a fire chaplain in Toronto and put on my firefighter uniform, I would feel a different way. And after worship, when I go home and put on a t-shirt and my, my uh, track pants, I feel a different way. Clothes have the power to expand our existence in interesting ways. My clothing not only expresses who I am, but it also forms who I am. It can shape who I am. It can shape our personality. The judge wears the gown. The bride wears the white dress. The doctor wears surgicals. A surgeon once confessed that the reason why she wore the uniform and the mask and the gloves was not only for hygiene, but also for the encouragement. She said this, if you're going into surgery to cut into another human being's body, you need to be a doctor even when you don't feel like it. When I put on all this stuff, I'm a doctor, no matter how I feel about it. Clothes have the power to shape us. Now, Paul, too, he loved this image of clothing. He knew the power of clothes. That's why in his letter to the Colossians, he wrote these words. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive, just as the Lord has forgiven you. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Isn't that beautiful? What a fantastic image. Clothe yourselves with love. Put it on in the morning. And to the church in Galatia, Paul wrote these words, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Don't just put on love. Put on Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, he says in Romans. Like your coat, like your pants, like your socks, put on Christ. Put on love. Wrap it around you. It's beautiful. This is a really interesting way of thinking about Christ, of wearing him. I mean, in, in one sense, it's kind of an an odd metaphor, but in another sense, it can be really powerful to think about enveloping ourselves with Christ so that our identity can be Christ-like. You have been clothed with Christ. You know, in the early centuries of the Christian church, people who were newly baptized were given the gift of a new white robe. That was no accident. It was a symbol of the, of the new Christian actually putting on Christ. It was an article of clothing which showed forth to all the, the status of the newly baptized, that they had returned through this symbol to their true nature as children made in the image of God. They were clothing themselves with Christ. They were clothing themselves with love. wonder, though, is, is being clothed with Christ something we do, or is it something God does for us? Or is it both? In the same way God created clothing for Adam and Eve as a way of providing for them in a time of need, maybe God, metaphorically, clothes us as a way of providing us with what we need. It's a cool thought. And what we need, really, these days is not something else to do. Far too often we define ourselves by our activities or our busyness. 
No, what we need most of the time is a powerful reminder of who we actually are. That we are people lovingly created by a God who knows every hair on our heads. And we are touched by a God who wants so desperately to be near us that God came to live with us in the Christ. We are healed by a God who continually forgives and picks us up when we stumble. That's who we are. We are God's creation. We are breathers of the breath of the very life of the God who made us. Maybe we're God's pride and joy. It's a nice thought. What joy it must bring to the heart of God when we remember that which we wear. For we wear Christ already. We have already been clothed with Christ. That symbol becomes a powerful reminder for us in our baptism. But we don't have to be baptized even to be clothed with Christ. That baptism acknowledges what has already become a reality for us. We are clothed with Christ. I love these words from the baptismal service. Baptism is a gift from God. With visible signs and words of promise, God moves toward us to claim us as children of the new covenant and members of the household of God. In baptism, God acts, God acts to unite us to Christ, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to call us to a new life of growth and service, being clothed in love. Why? So that we can actually love. Baptism is a beautiful sacrament of grace. It acknowledges that God has already come to us. God has already accepted us. This is about God's activity. This is what God does for us. God has clothed us with Christ and that clothing has the power to shape us. I wonder, how can this idea of being clothed in Christ, how can this idea be a gift to you in your life right now? How can that change who you are? I wonder... It is wonderful to be all together here this morning. We're so grateful for Hugh, for your message. I love that message of being clothed in Christ in all the way, different ways we can do that. Thank you for the choir members who are here who are contributing extra leadership voices to the music and to MC and the tech team and 
thank you for all of you here present in person and at home. We have a few events coming up in um, the coming weeks that we want to highlight and ministries. Um, we MC along with um, those she teaches will be having a special concert jazz for adults, which is coming back this spring. Um, and it is Saturday, May the 28th at 3 p.m. Um, and this will be a wonderful afternoon of music. And if you would like to come, it is um, pay what you can, free will donations. Um, and it, it, it'll be a wonderful afternoon of music. So we invite you to join us for that. In-person Sunday school for all ages from JK up to grade 12 has started back again. Um, and it is great to have the children and youth back in the, in the building. And um, we look forward to them also joining in the worship space again at the beginning of worship. We still need some more Sunday school teachers. Just like everything in COVID, it ha it's taking a while to get back into some of these regular and important and treasured ministries in our church. And so if you're curious about possibly teaching or just helping with Sunday school, please reach out to Carol. And you don't have to make a long-term commitment. It can just be a week or two when you're available. But it's just an amazing way to build intergenerational relationships with all ages in our church community. It is with heavy hearts that we share the sad news that a beloved member of our congregation, Stephanie Prisnick, died last Sunday evening. Stephanie has been a lifelong member of the congregation and has struggled with her health her whole life. She is, is one of those people who they didn't think was going to live through her first month and she lived 32 wonderful years where she contributed so much to everyone who knew her and especially to this Knox community and to the Logos community. Um, so we ask you to keep her family in your prayers, keep Barb and and Beth and Fred in your prayers and we will be having a celebration of life service here Tuesday at 11 a.m. and it will be live streamed and so we hope that you can participate in this service. We are continuing on with our Stewardship Growing Generosity series and today we have a member of the congregation Amy Zavitz who um, has been a part of the congregation since 2016 and she has so many gifts and passions to share with this congregation but she has a heart especially for inclusion and justice um, and so we look forward to hearing a message from her about how we can all think about stewardship in this Knox community in new ways. Good morning everyone. Peace to each of you. My name is Amy Zavitz, and I have been part of the Knox Waterloo community since 2016. I started attending Knox when I moved back to Waterloo to attend grad school just across the street at the Balsillie School of International Affairs. I had recently returned to Canada after living and working in northern Malawi with a partner of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. Coming back to Canada, I knew I wanted to connect with a faith community, but I wasn't sure where or which one or what that should look like. I attended different spaces of worship that didn't feel the right fit. I didn't feel the sense of connection or belonging that I was looking for. Through other Presbyterian channels that I was connected to, I was invited to join the March at Pride in Toronto in 2016, led by Knox. And I remember feeling like my worlds were colliding. My desire to see communities grounded in inclusion and justice and my evolving understanding of what it meant to be a Christian. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this event and the wider inclusion ministry at Knox started to stitch me back together, to see a solid example of an affirming congregation and what it can really look like when we say that God's love includes everyone. 
So I started attending Knox and was quickly found by Nancy Matthews, who used her gifts of gracious hospitality to get me connected with the Food for Thought community. Over the years, I've led worship arts and junior high Bible time at Logos, contributed to Wednesdays at Knox, shared witness to the realities of our partners in Malawi and Palestine during worship, and was married here. I've continued to find myself inspired by the expansive theology, the radical hospitality, and the gracious community here. This community has grown to become an important part of the fabric of my life, and I know that through the ministries, connections, and relationships, this holds true for many other young adults. I hold gratitude for this community, for its openness, for its welcoming, for its programming, and for each of you. Thank you. Thank you to Amy for sharing a little bit about what drew her to Knox in this community of faith, what um, has her continue to give of her time and her talents and her treasures to, to our ever-growing and changing community. These stories over the last few weeks have really given us a sense of, their, of all the different types of people who are part of our community and why they are here and why they continue to stay and to co contribute um, and also what they need from us. So I hope it has inspired you to think about um, your stewardship relationship with the church and inspired you to generous living that reflects God. Music and laughter, hands and minds, curiosity and compassion are all an abundance of gifts that we have been given, that we clothe ourselves with. All these gifts are symbolized in our offerings. Let us commit ourselves in a service as we worship God with our offering.
Please be seated. Today we acknowledge and celebrate the wide spectrum of mothering that exists in our world. We commend mothering for the ways it reflects the image of God by bringing forth new life, nurturing those on her path, living with the tension of both providing freedom and a safety net. Mother's Day has a long history and was not created just as a hallmark holiday to push flowers and gifts. <laughs> Celebrations of mothers and motherhood can be traced back to the ancient Greeks and Romans who held festivals of honor of the mother goddess Rhea and Sibyl, but the clearest modern precedent for Mother's Day is the early Christian festival of Mothering Sunday. The origins of Mother's Day as celebrated in Canada and the U.S. date back to the 19th century in the years before the Civil War. Anne Reeves Jarvis of West Virginia helped start Mother's Day work clubs to teach local women how to properly care for their children. Another precursor to Mother's Day came from the abolitionist and suffragette Julia Ward Howe. In 1970, sorry, 1870, Howe wrote a Mother's Day proclamation that some of you might be familiar of. It's a call to action that asked mothers to unite in promoting world peace. As you can see, there is a long history of advocacy and justice seeking affiliated with Mother's Day. Mother's Day can be a time of celebration. It can also be a time of pain and struggle for some people who have loss that they've experienced, who have challenging relationships as mothers or with their mothers. And so we think of all this as we join in prayer together. Loving Spirit, scriptures have painted a vision of how you are a mother to us, giving us life, teaching us the way to live, helping us to find our way when we have lost direction, protecting us, providing us safety and comfort, feeding and nurturing us with good things. We are grateful for all your mothering, not only of us, but of all your creation. We pray today for the wide spectrum of mothering that exists in our lives. To those who have birthed this year their first child, we celebrate you. To those who lost a child, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or a child running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes and prods, tears and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this harder than it is. To those who are mothers through adoption, we give thanks to you for providing a new home and family. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who have lost their mothers and deeply miss their presence, we grieve with you. To those who experience abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who lived through driving tests, medical tests, and overall testing of motherhood, we are grateful for the ways that your presence has endured. To those who have chosen abortion, we acknowledge that this is your choice for your life and your body. 
to those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you longed for it to be. For those who step parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who have chosen not to become mothers, but give of themselves in so many other ways, we are grateful for you. To those who envision lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who have emptier nests in the coming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who have placed children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expecting and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother Day, Mother's Day, we walk with all of you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you. And all God's people say, Amen. Let us join together in our closing hymn, number 371, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. May the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you along the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open yourselves to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you.
I'm Hugh Donnelly, one of the ministers at Knox Waterloo. Thank you for being a part of the worshipping community today. You can find us online at knoxwaterloo.ca and you are always welcome to call us at 519-886-4150. This broadcast is made possible by you, listeners and friends of Knox, who support Knox's broadcast ministry. Please consider making a donation in gratitude as you are able, and may the peace of Christ be with you.